All right, for those of you just joining us, we are going to get started on our event for today. On behalf of all of us at the Executives Club, welcome to Women in Technology, how female leaders have pivoted from business to technology. This is one of our flagship events from the Business Technology Forum, and we'd like to thank our partners over at Accenture and CBW for supporting this important programming with us. So we have a lot to get to in the next hour. I will hand things over to one of our co-chairs of the Business Technology Forum, Bob Kress from Accenture. Thank you, Megan, and good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to our virtual business technology forum event, uh, Women in Technology, How Female Leaders Have Pivoted from Business to Tech. Uh, I'm Bob Kress, Managing Director with Accenture and co-chair of the Executives Club Business Technology Forum, along with Mark Lafferty from CDW. So I'm really excited to welcome everyone today. Our women events for technology have been some of the uh, most well-attended, most interesting, I think most valuable uh, events that we've done over the years. And so this has become kind of an annual event for us. And I think today is going to be outstanding. Um, as, as many of you know, uh, we've tried to highlight uh, female leaders in technology or people who have moved into and out of technology really as a way to demonstrate and show extremely successful examples for others and hopefully inspire others, including our, you know, younger children and, and girls to aspire to these types of roles in the future. So the theme for the discussion today is going to be highlighting women and their various paths to technology leadership. As we all know, technology is becoming more and more pervasive in all aspects of the business of businesses and uh, not-for-profits. If technology underpins virtually every business function and organization that's out there today. So this is a great opportunity for uh, us to demonstrate, you know, how women leaders are coming into their own and can be great examples for others to improve our gender mix in our technology leadership, um, you know, uh, across the entire profession. So um, before we get started, I do have a housekeeping note for the audience. Uh, in the past month, the Executives Club launched a new podcast called The Executives Exchange, featuring CEO and founder interviews with top leaders in Chicago. One of today's speakers, Amanda Lannert, is featured on the podcast, and her episode will be dropping uh, later this year. So please take a moment uh, to take out your phone and subscribe to the Executives Exchange whenever you get uh, your or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, Megan also has put a link in the chat for where you can learn more. So for today's event, we would encourage you to keep on your video. Um, if that helps make you feel a little bit more engaged. Now, I do realize we're over the lunch hour. So those of you who uh, are trying to grab lunch and participate, uh, that's fine as well if you prefer not to be on video and have everyone watch you eating your lunch. Uh, but we're thrilled today with our lineup of, of uh, speakers and panelists. Uh, Amanda Lannert from Jelly Vision, uh, Jamila Parnum from Microsoft and the Tech Unicorn, uh, Delna Strauss from Keo, and Violet Sistaveris from Nysource. And our good friend, uh, Aletha Noonan from CDW is back with us again this year, moderating today's conversation. So it's a fantastic lineup, a great variety of speakers and roles. We will have time for audience questions at the end of the program and encourage you to send them in via the chat icon on the bottom of the screen. So I know we're in for a great discussion today and thank you once again uh, to, for all of you for joining us today, and in particular for our speakers, taking the time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to do this. So Aletha, over to you. Thank you, Bob. 
And you know I'm better in person, but I'm thrilled to be with you all here today and introduce and chat with this um, amazing group of women. Um, we're gonna get started with just a little um, icebreaker. Tell us um, about yourself, a little bit about your organization and what you do today. Um, Amanda, let's get started with you. So I'm Amanda Lannert. I'm the CEO of an HR tech company called Jelly Vision. Uh, and we help uh, meaningfully reduce the cost of benefits confusion for employers and their employees. So we, we license software to mostly large employers to help them help their employees choose and use health insurance and other benefits. Thank you. Welcome, Amanda. Um, Jamila. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamila Parham. I am the founder and owner of the Tech Unicorn, and that is an initiative making sure that there's diversity in STEM when it comes to leadership, um, being a voice for underrepresented and undervalued communities and providing positive role models in STEM and technology. So I am a solopreneur, um, and I also climbed the cor corporate ladder uh, at Microsoft, where I'm a senior program manager in the justice and public safety sector. So I'm very passionate about civic tech. I've done work with the city of Chicago for smart city lighting and also technology for the CTA. So I'm just very excited to be here with some amazing women today. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Welcome. And let's go to Delna. Hi there, Delna Strauss. Uh, I'm the COO and co-founder of Kio. Kio is a biometric identity platform. We replace keys, cards, tickets, fobs, anything in your uh, pockets we're taking uh, taking it out. And uh, my background is in economics and social enterprises, and I'm excited to talk about my journey to tech. And uh, yep, looking forward to hearing all your questions. Excited about it. We're excited about hearing about your journey, Delna. And Violet, um, please introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. And it's wonderful to be part of this uh, wonderful uh, panel of women leaders. Um, Violet Sistaveras, I'm an executive vice president with NYSource. NYSource is a parent company for energy companies. And um, my last role was running one of the largest, probably the, one of the most complex of the, of the six companies. Um, the, probably the only one you might be familiar with, that's NIPSCO, which is the gas and electric utility just over the border. A very active in Chicago. I've, I've been on the board of the Girl Scouts for over 10 years and very involved with the STEM program there. And at NYSource, we actually um, started and we're our uh, seventh year of uh, girls in engineering, where we, you know, bring the girls in and actually introduce them to our women leaders and women engineers. Um, my current role as an experience officer, just to demystify that, um, I am um, in charge of human resources, including labor relations, corporate communications, and customer for the six companies um, under the Nice Source umbrella. Thank you, and welcome. You know, I think as we talked about this panel ahead of time, and we met together as a group, we talked about just kind of the journey not being linear and how the decision making and moments in time and also about how technology is so pervasive across the world and, you know, this intersection between business jobs and technology jobs is becoming more and more blurred, as you'll learn from our um, panelists today. So I'm just going to go around the room and ask you to talk earlier in your career, you know, what was your major or your background, and then what was your first role or first real job? And you know, just talk about, just give a, a thought on on that moment in time. And why don't we just go backward, and we'll have, Violet will have you kick us off. All right. Um, well, um, I'm so old; it's almost hard to remember that far back. But my undergraduate uh, degree was in marketing, and my first role was in marketing, which doesn't happen all that much anymore. But I actually did market research and product development um, in banking, and uh, that was back in '85, and banking had just and deregulated. So I did marketing for about three years. And um, as often as the case, and I'm guessing we're going to hear from the other panelists, my, uh, my career has twisted and turned ever since then. Thank you. I think twist and turn might be a, a theme today. Uh, <laughs> Del Delana, um, um, tell us about your first year background and then your first real job. Sure. Um, I, you know, I was focused on being a, a finance person. Uh, I have my backgrounds in economics and management, uh, but I graduated, you know, in 2009, 
And uh, you can imagine there was not the best time to graduate. So it was an extremely difficult time to try to find a good career in finance. <laughs> Um, but it was also an excellent opportunity in a weird way for me to dive into something I really cared about, which was social enterprises and raising funds for companies that were doing more than just like the, the, the bottom line. So um, I took a, you know, I took a couple of like unpaid gigs initially to get started with and eventually found my place at Calvert Investments. So uh, non-traditional is definitely something I should just add it that, that, that to my middle name, to be honest. <laughs> I haven't done it yet, but it will. Thank you. Amanda. So I'm the kid of academics. My dad um, knew what he wanted to be from the time he was 15 years old and only did exactly that until he retired in his mid seventies, uh, which was he wanted to be a neurologist studying Parkinson's disease. So I kind of took that background of growing up in a household that really prioritized studying. And I went to school with the plan of being uh, uh, you know, a liberal arts executive who ends up getting a JDMD so I could write public policy for hospitals, sort of at the line of, of science and ethics, what to do with abandoned embryos, what to do around euthanasia, things like that. But I got a chance to spend my junior year abroad at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, where I studied beer and boys instead of science, and I got behind in my pre-med. So I came back with a concentration in English literature around Augustan to Romantic poetry and found out that my dad was not going to pay for a fifth year of undergrad so that I could complete my pre-med. And really, it was like my first pivot where I was off the dole. I had no skills, no network, and no experience whatsoever. And I said, what is a person in this situation to do? I know, advertising. And so quite luckily, I ended up uh, getting a job. I applied for one job at one company. It was Leo Burnett. And I landed there. You know, I graduated on a Friday, showed up at Leo Burnett on a Monday, and got a chance to spend $110 million a year getting kids to eat. Pop-Tarts and Eggo waffles and Nutri-Grain bars. And this is before we knew Pop-Tarts might be poison. I felt really good about it at the time, but I went immediately into a world of, of CPG marketing. And I kind of remember like the decision-making around what to do. And I think it's a really important lesson um, for me that I still apply today, that anytime you're trying to do something new, there are two sets of skills, you know, two sets of things you need. Some are competence and some is confidence. And I think when you're making big career decisions, more often than not, like I didn't think I could offer anyone anything. So I went into advertising and it turned out to be, you know, really lucky, but confidence is sometimes more often what's lacking. Uh, and I hope that's a big theme that comes through is like work on confidence as much as you work on anything else and greater opportunities will unroll in front of you. I love it. I took the notes, confidence and confidence. And as I have a, an emerging college freshman, I want to make sure she's now completely majoring in beer and boys. Um, Jamila, I, I'd love to have you round out that question and then eat, um, move into our next question, which really gets to, to the meat. Talk to us um, first about you know, your background and your first job. And then as you thought about your journey and, and those skills that you needed and the skills that um, weren't obvious, what were some of those um, things that you prepared for or lessons that you learned as a, as a tech leader in moving into tech. So first job, background, and then move right into our next question and tell us about, you know, that, that lesson of moving into tech leader, tech leadership and tech jobs. Definitely. Um, so I am, you know, born and raised in Chicago from the South side. And, you know, I was a CPS student and I had a love for video games. And I thought like, is this a career that I could really pursue? Um, throughout my career, I've learned that success, of course, is not a straight line, it's a jungle gym. So we've all jumped from here to there. Sometimes, you know, that move might not make sense in the moment, but holistically, the big picture, when it comes together, when we look at your journey, it, it makes sense. So um, when I went into DePaul University, I majored in computer graphics and animation, really get into like the video gaming realm. Um, and I didn't see a lot of women that looked like me or people of color. And that kind of fed into me starting the tech unicorn years later. Uh, but when I started doing computer graphics and animation, uh, I graduated as well in like uh, 2008. And that was with the, the big market crash. And you couldn't really find opportunities and you really had to create your own way. Um, I tried to start my own graphic design company. It was very, very challenging um, at that moment. Uh, my first job was working with TomTom, uh, creating uh, you know, GPS system interfaces. 
And uh, that was back when it was a standalone GPS system. We all have it in our phones now, but that was one of my first jobs and how I broke into graphic design. And then I kind of pivoted within technology. So I jumped from computer graphics animation to information systems management, project management. And uh, the way I broke into IT was uh, taking a job that no one else wanted. <laughs> you know, no one wanted to work weekends and log tickets and get students access to their, you know, uh, information and transcripts and things like that. I worked Saturday and Sunday and, um, you know, while everybody else was out partying and bar crawling. And um, that really paved the way to me. And to address that second question, um, the most important skill that I learned along the way was everything isn't technical. It's not listed on the resume. What worked for me is um, it's about someone's experience of you, right? And when I took that job that no one else wanted, uh, my manager at the time just was like, you know, really impressed. And down the line, I was able to get other opportunities. He was a great reference and ally for me. Um, so I think that was one of the most important skills. It's not technical, it's people. Um, what is someone's experience of you? Um, there's a quote from Maya Angelou that says, you know, people don't remember what you did or all the specifics, but they remember how you made them feel, right? So if it was a great experience, you think about, wow, we achieved great things together. I don't remember all from A to Z what we did, but working with this person um, was great. And we have a next initiative coming up. You know, your name, you know, comes up. It's about the brand of when you enter the room, you know, what do people say? When you leave the room, what people say? And when you're not there, um, what has their experience been working with you? So that was one of the skills that was most valuable to me. And the irony is it's not technical at all. You know, it sounds similar to what Amanda was saying about confidence and confidence, you know, having the confidence and confidence to go focus on what you do know, as opposed to worrying about what you don't know. And this isn't on the prepared remarks, but I would like to hear from um, any of you on just your thought on that, um, that ability to, to enter in, you know, other people's ability to enter into tech, but maybe not having a formal tech background. So I don't know if, um, Del, know if you want to comment on just that you know, your personal experience and then thoughts for um, the people listening today on, you know, how do you take that leap? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, something that uh, Jamila said reminded me of uh, a very weird time when I was at the airport and I was standing in front of the immigration officer and, you know, he was like, oh, why do, why do we need more of you over here or something like that? And I was like, oh, well, because no one wants to do my job. <laughs> it was really true because, social enterprises at the time were, were trying to find candidates who were willing to do, have liberal arts backgrounds or untraditional backgrounds, nonprofit or technical, didn't, didn't really matter. It's like, as long as you had the confidence to be there and problem solve, they wanted you. And it was a fantastic opportunity for me, but it, it, needed, it needed me to take the initiative to get forward, the confidence to say, I can do this, even though I'm coming in from a different perspective. And it, it also needed the other side, which is the other side to say, you know, you don't quite have the technical skills that we still want, but we want you to, 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 to test the waters. And it's fantastic. I got a chance to be a part of a very small team that deployed millions of dollars in companies like Seventh Generation. And I get to see those now on the stands and say I had a part of it. So I think in terms of taking that leap, it's really sometimes about pushing yourself a little bit ahead of what you can do, but also taking opportunities that may not immediately seem like the path, uh, because the, I think the whole linear path, uh, career path is outdated. Um, and I, you know, I was thinking about this and I wanted to kind of go into a spiel of it, but at least I'll, I'll mention it quickly that you know, that path was created for a certain group of people who did really, really well using that. And it left out a lot of different marginalized, uh, not as represented communities. So we do need to create different paths. I love that Jamila said it's like, you know, the path is a jungle gym. And that's 100% true for my experience as well. So there's data behind that. Um, when I started 20 years ago, 20 odd years ago, the average uh, American worker changed careers, not jobs, but careers seven times. 20 years later, it's up to 12. And I'm sure it's going to reshape again post pandemic. Um, so the idea of doing one job is completely outdated and irrelevant because in 20 years, we will all be doing jobs that don't exist right now. So the idea of getting into tech, if you're interested in tech, let's kind of demystify it. Really, every company is now a tech company due to the power of computing, just like the machines we all have on our desks and machine learning and business process outsourcing, like really we're all tech. 
And I'm just going to echo again, there are a lot of jobs in tech that do not require engineering skills. You don't need to be able to write in a certain syntax to work in tech. And I think, you know, as you start to get comfortable, like the, in many ways, tech is simpler and that we don't have manufacturing plants and we don't have stores and we, it's a, sort of a simpler P&L in certain respects. Um, and, and sort of like the lesson is there are going to be things in any industry where you're over your skis and you don't understand. And if you can't answer the questions, then you need to get good at asking them. And being good at asking business questions actually translates. Uh, you don't have to have all the answers. You just have to learn how to uh, ask good questions, which I'm not sitting here as some expert, like I'm a work in progress on asking good questions. But I think that that, that being able to unlock domain knowledge in somebody else is an utterly transferable skill. Thank you. Um, Violet, do you want to add anything about taking that leap and just specific guidance on that leap into tech? Yeah, I'm happy to weigh in. And I think, you know, your your use of the word leap um, is definitely something that resonates with me. I remember very distinctly the day that my um, boss called me and said, I want you to become the CIO for the organization. And back then we could actually talk on the phone and drive. So I remember dr I was actually driving into Chicago and my immediate, my immediate response was, you know, I'm not that technical. Like I am constantly on the phone with our help desk, Bob. And he said, um, yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> Cause I also, you know, sat right next to him. Yeah, I know. He said, but you know, the business and, um, you know, that really resonated with me. So I would say a couple of things, um, one to pick up on Amanda's point of don't, you know, technology is a, is a part of every single role that probably we could articulate or define that is out there. Um, the other thing I would say, especially to a larger women audience, uh, and I've raised a 30 something very confident daughter. Um, so I think it is a little gender based is we tend to really listen to the voice in our heads. And I will tell you in a 35 plus year career, if, if I'd listened to the voice, the first voice, in my head every time I really wouldn't have had the opportunities and the twists and turns and the ongoing learning and the ability to contribute to, in my case, two organizations. I was in banking for 10 years and I've been with NYSource for 25 years. So don't do that. Don't listen to that first voice um, is what I would say. The, I, prior to co coming into the CIO role, I had been running our call centers you know, for, for the nice source companies. And the reality of it is you have to think about those transferable skills because I went into those call centers and there was hardly technology. I mean, phones, we had 10 million calls coming in to our call centers in a year and we were still picking up a heart, you know, an actual phone. And I, and I was the leader that brought in a level of technology, you know, whether it was the IVR, the, um, the scripting, the soft phones. I mean, our reps went from a phone and a small computer screen to no phone and three screens on their desk. And we were able to, uh, by introducing technology, we were able to not only take out like 35% of cost from our operation, which for a regulated entity relates to more affordable gas and electric service to our customers, but customer satisfaction and employee satisfaction also went up. So even though my voice first said, don't do it, don't do it. And I was really fearful. The, the, I really reflected on, you know, I, I've changed the makeup of customer service for NYSource by introducing technology and the change for both employees and customers associated with that technology. And that was enough to Amanda's point on confidence. That was enough of a tailwind to at least give me a level of confidence that, you know, um, I do know the business. I do know what customers want. I have a healthy enough background with employee, you know, from an HR standpoint. And I took that leap. Thank you. I, you know, I wanted to hone in on some of the themes I am. Um, I'm a woman in technology who has a journalism degree. We talked about that in the background, but I, I work at a company that is a tech company. And then there are, there are jobs that are tech jobs 
within companies that aren't tech. I think Amanda said every job is, every company is essentially in technology now. But some real practical advice I could give as I've been in the position I'm in, I have people who come to me for job referrals or introductions into companies. If there are companies that you're interested in and you believe you have knowledge in, whether it's, you know, one of the things that we, we tend to see at CDW is our vertical expertise. So we have a healthcare segment and a public sector um, K through 12 and an education segment. So we may have somebody who may not know technology, but they, all, they know the decision makers who buy technology and we can teach them the nuances of technology. So I would say take that, that net of what you know or where you have confidence and then think about what types of companies you may want to intersect in. Um, one one um, person that I helped trans, trans, trans move into the tech industry who had, was a formerly a, um, a, a trader for um, currency and he understood software and he understood um, money. <laughs> and now, you know, he, he got into a, an initial software job and now he's, um, he went from a job in, at Microsoft and now he's a, um, a, a leader at Dell. But that transfer came from previously being a trader. So I would say, you know, do what you know, or um, in Jamila's case, video games or whatever it may be that's of interest, and then figure out the path. And then one final really practical tip is if there are people you know in your network or that you sort of know, like, like people like us, and there's something that you think they can make an introduction to, whether you're looking at their LinkedIn profile, be very specific, you know, scour my LinkedIn profile and say, hey, I'm interested in this particular company. Do you have an introduction over here? But I would say it's, there's some practical things that people transferring into roles or into companies can do by focusing on what do I already know and what am I good at and where does that apply in that, in that job search. So I'm not, I'm the moderator, I'm not the, I'm not the participant. So Del, now I'm going to move over to you. Um, I, I think this is great. You have an economics degree and a background in nonprofit social enterprise, and you're a co-founder of a highly technical privacy focus. I mean, you're you're, you, you're, you're the jam. Um, so I have a two part question and I have to read it because I, I, I want to make sure that we get this out. How did your understanding of business in the marketplace help you in your founder's journey? And then tell us how um, COVID, COVID impacted the rise of the um, contactless payment and, and the kind of work that you're doing. Uh, thank you. I, I'd raise my hand because I was like, I just want to hype you up. I have another comment to add to your practical terms is the don't be intimidated by tech jargon is the other big thing, you know, that don't be don't look at job descriptions with the title and say, oh, man, I don't have that thing that, the you know, it says product development. Oh, shoot, I can't be in product development. Because honestly, when you start reading and you start digging into it, you realize what they really need is someone to organize. They need somebody to put things in a list and then prioritize. And those are not necessarily specifically technical skills. So I highly encourage people to get into it and kind of see. And in terms of your the question you asked, which I think nicely segues into this is um, my whole thing by being in non, the nonprofit sector and the social enterprise sector, I kind of realized really quickly we don't have a really good digital ID for uh, it, for providing services. Um, it, there, there, I could tell you a gambit of issues with various nonprofits, foundations, and organizations that can't always identify the key groups that they want to be able to service and support. So, in my journey, I realized that I could use technology to solve for a digital ID in the physical world, and that's how I ended up creating with my co-founders, a biometric identity platform. So based in privacy, where the user has an opportunity to decide whether they wanna keep or delete these things. So that was critical and kind of important to me. And in terms of matching that up with these non-traditional backgrounds, I got now I'm in a position to hire. You know, Now I'm in a position to, to be able to get people in that I think can do the job and not necessarily where they studied, what, uh, of course I need some experts. You know, There are certain fields where I can't get away with not having someone who is a lead uh, engineer or someone who understands uh, electrical engineering because we're a hardware connected software company. But there were so many other roles like in operations. Uh, my operations manager is uh, still finishing his uh, PhD dissertation. I love that because in a way it shows me that he has the ability to, to think about things differently or be able to manage multiple uh, um, projects at the same time. Uh, our marketing manager resides in France, and then I, I, I appreciate that as well because she gives us a multinational competitive advantage. 
whereas where we could uh, partner with companies like Visa to do exciting marketing activations in for the Women's World Cup in France, you know, another uh, awesome thing that's close to my heart. Uh, so I think that non-traditional is is not just like, oh, it's, it, you know, it, it's something that we want to uh, keep in mind. But it, I think when you hire, you just make it part of your hiring process. So in my founder's journey, I think I took the, uh, the version of like, okay, I didn't qualify for a lot of things or I didn't fit the bill for what people were looking for in this field. Uh, I'm not a hoodie wearing uh, <laughs> a tech founder. I think we, Amanda probably has met a ton of those and so has everyone else on this panel. But you know, just because I don't, I think that there is a space where I can. And then I take that and kind of move along um, in the space to, to do what I do. In terms of how the pandemic and COVID-19 changed the game for us, um, it, it's, a, it, it's a dichotomy. For, it was a dichotomy for us. So we had, uh, you can imagine having a contactless biometric identity device suddenly makes us the most relevant we've ever been in the last five years that we've been doing this. But at the same time, our customers were seeing supply chain issues, layoffs, budget cuts. So now we're all super relevant, but not necessarily uh, in the affordable range. So how do you kind of match that up? Add to that, you know, making sure our team members are safe. We're lucky we were a remote company. Uh, but we still had, you know, members who were, who had to drop out or take time or get well or whatever they have to do. So what I did, and I think this goes back to just being in the nonprofit space, uh, I went back to my community. So I went back to our vendors and investors and even our competitors and said, this is complete, something we've never seen before. What can we do? What can Kyo do here that will allow us to, you know, be able to survive, but also provide something to the world while this is happening? Uh, and one of our major competitors, the, uh, the, I think they have the most market share for palm vein ID devices uh, that does patient ID. Um, their devices essentially became defunct over, overnight because they didn't have a contactless solution. You had to touch their devices to actually use it. And you can imagine patients, doctors, hospitals, were not gonna use that anymore. So overnight they had this major issue and we didn't say, well, <laughs> let them figure it out. We kind of said, let's do this. We have a contactless solution. We think this could work for you. What else do you need with it? Uh, it was fantastic. We got, went to vendors and said, you know, help us rapidly prototype and push this out. Uh, all companies in Canada said, hey, you have a copper alloy that you use on elevator doors. Can we use it on our devices? We got it together. We created like the team around it. Um, and then we launched last year, we put 3000 of these things in hospitals and next week we're producing another 4,000 with the, with the intention and the idea that we could grow together. And I think that comes truly from my background in the nonprofit world and my co-founders uh, focus on public health and everything else that has made them who they are because they are a pretty non-traditional group as well. It's great. It's great that, that we, we can grow together. Um, I, want, I do want to pivot off of that and go to Jamila, Jamila in just a moment, but please use the chat feature for questions. Um, we're going to get to the question section in just um, a few minutes here, um, but I do want to chat with Jamila specifically um, on that same thread of you talked about in your bio having limited tech resources and limited ways to achieve your technical aspirations. Can you talk about what you did or what, what was your perseverance? And then maybe talk a little bit more about um, your thoughts on what we as leaders and people in tech and in business can do to open the pipeline to more, um, you know, I think of it as the money ball of the talent pipeline. Let's get people before they're made to the perfect um, athlete and get them why they're, they have great potential. So give us your thoughts on you personally and then on what we can do more as, as we grow together. Definitely. Um, for me, um, you know, I had some great mentors and allies around the way um, that helped me along in my career. Um, like I said, I, you know, I went to CPS. I really wasn't in, engaged with coding until I really started my undergraduate curriculum. And I just really had to go to a lot of tutoring. I had that voice as well. What Violet said, you know, like, are you, you know, supposed to hear, be here? Can you really do this? And it's like, you're forever fighting that voice, you know? So for me, um, I had those mentors that really helped me along the way. Uh, really being engaged with my community. Uh, one of my mentors said, um, you know, as you're pursuing your career, one key thing to be is obsessed. You know, being obsessed with your craft, 
And he told me, if your social life is booming, if this is booming and you're, you're not loving on your craft, you're doing something wrong, right? So, you know, just being obsessive about what you're passionate about has worked for me. Um, they show that 50% of women lead technology more so than men. And you want to look at the root cause of where is that coming from? There's a number of things, you know, the culture, was it welcoming? Do you feel a sense of a belonging? Um, are there pathways to leadership? Are you investing in your culture and your workforce? Um, there's something called a middle management trap. And, you know, I'm like, I'm very happy to be here because I am also pursuing going up the ladder. Uh, I'm not exactly a CEO yet. So I am in middle management. So I think it's just important to really invest in your workforce and make sure you retain talent. Um, there's different levels to that. And then, you know, what I do with the tech unicorn, there's important to have uh, importance of having positive role models. Um, where I come from, from the South side of Chicago, I didn't see women in tech. I didn't know it was possible. So I think engaging youth early on, uh, making sure there's programs to let them know that there are careers in STEM and, you know, technology isn't writing lines of code all day. It can be, but you can choose another way. Um, you know, engaging high schools and engaging HBCUs, city colleges. Um, there's so much going on, especially with the reach of social media. Um, companies like Microsoft, we have Microsoft Aspire, which has a whole training program for students who are coming, you know, in college and internships, getting prepared for the work, workforce. Um, Amazon, Microsoft are having certificate programs that are accelerated and training them for, you know, cloud computing, which is the future, and they have grants for that. So um, a lot of times there are barriers when it comes to, you know, the monetary aspect, but um, there's ways to definitely reinvest. So I think those are just like a couple of points. Um, and we all have a platform, no matter how big or small that you think it is, you have a voice. Um, you can be an ally, you can be a mentor. I mentor a lot. And, you know, I may not be at the top of my career, but everyone has something to give and something to share. And I think a huge part of success is showing up. I've showed up in rooms where I didn't even know if I was supposed to be there, what it was about, but you meet people, you learn new things. You know, 90% of it is showing up. Just show up. And that's that's most of it. So I think those are a key, couple key points I think were helpful for me, hopefully helpful for the audience. I, th I think it's great advice. And I think Delna said, don't be afraid of the words. For, for the record, the words changed. All the big tech words change anyway. So once you learn them, I, I, I literally have to have a new set of uh, abbreviations at, at any given time. Amanda, speaking of you know empowering tech leaders and and building pipeline of talent, you know you're a CEO of a tech company and you're a female CEO, which is you know um, not a lot of female CEOs at tech companies and certainly not a lot of female CEOs at large companies. Talk to us about um, how you became the CEO and what the reaction was, and did you feel that there was any um, thing you had to do to prove yourself or how was that transition for you and how were you received? I'll try to tell this quickly, um, but it's it's a pretty, it's a formative story. Um, I had been working with Jelly Vision's founder and CEO for years. And one day on my birthday, he said, let's go to lunch. And I thought that was weird that he wanted to go to lunch alone on my birthday, but so be it. So we get in a cab and we go to the Art Institute and we're sitting outside on a lovely September day. And he goes, wait, rather than going inside, let's just sit on this bench and enjoy the weather. And I'm like, that's weird too. And after we're talking for a little bit, he pulls out his messenger bag and reaches in and pulls out a gift. It's a third weird thing because he's not a gifty guy. I'm a gifty person. He's not a gifty guy. And he hands me a gift bag and I pick it up and it's very heavy. And right away in my head, I go, oh no, he's gift wrapped a brick. And this brick is going to be a metaphor for what we're building together. And this brick is going to have to live on my desk. And I'm trying to be minimalistic, but this brick is going to live on my desk as long as I'm at Jelly Vision, because it's a metaphor for what we're building. And it might even have a plaque on it. And he goes, you got, you got to open it. And I'm like, okay, it's going to have a plaque on it. This brick is going to have a plaque. And I go to open it up and it's not a brick. It's a box of business cards with a title CEO. And my moment of transition was a, what? No, what? No, he's like, uh huh, yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 what? No. So, as an ambitious person and as someone who's had a really great career, there was zero intentionality in me becoming a CEO. So, one of my first lessons to everyone else is like, be intentional and have audacious dreams. Um, the second sort of part of it is I had real sort of hesitation for the next two months because it wasn't a transition I had planned in my head. It wasn't, I thought, something I thought had seemed coming. And the founder and former CEO of Jelly Vision was one of the most charismatic, brilliant people. And I'm the suit. 
I'm the business person. I'm the one who's like, but how do we make money? You know, not how do we tend to, well, how do we make money? And I thought who people who wanted to work for him aren't going to want to work for me. And it caused a sort of a, a, a two month pause before I really was like, no, I'm, I'm going to actually start to do this. And I said, even though I work in spreadsheets, not scripts, like, you know, how can I find my authority to lead? And I just began listening and problem solving and listening and problem solving. And as you get bigger, you hire other people to listen and problem solve. And as you get more optimistic, you start to listen, problem solve and find opportunities. But you don't have to have all the, the answers like business businessing leadership those are those are team sports so i would say i wish i had been more intentional i wish i had you know on day one and had a plan i didn't and i wish i would say i didn't face it with profound self-doubt for someone as mouthy as i am profound self-doubt is a constant uh, and so i think like the whole the whole idea of becoming a, a ceo isn't that i ever know what i'm doing i'm constantly ahead of my skis i'm constantly careening down a mountain but I now have confidence, not in what I know, but in what I can figure out. Uh, th there have been so many moments, like one of the most profound moments as CEO, where I was like, I don't know how to do that. I was in a board meeting and I was asked to go raise a round of secondary capital, $20 million of secondary capital, which means it's not like I have an idea, I want more investment. I am getting liquidity for shareholders. And I remember saying, okay, I need to go do that. And I wanted to say, how do I do that? But I didn't want to seem dumb in front of my board. So I left the meeting and I sat down, opened my laptop and started Googling it. And it's amazing what you can learn just by you know reading online. And I took the process, we got the $20 million all the way to contract. And I remember being at the moment of saying, I now don't know what I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. I cannot take this any further. I need help. And my general counsel swooped in and our board swooped in and outside counsel swooped in. And suddenly like, I didn't have to do it myself anymore. And that's really business. Uh, so I would say, don't worry about what you know, worry about what you can figure out. Being a self-adaptive learner is the single most valuable skill that anyone can have moving into this you know, side of the century. Uh, and then have a sense of humor, be a little, a little self-forgiving uh, because it ended up being a really great story, even though in the moment of getting the keys to this company that I love, that has been my career, I wasn't gracious, I wasn't ready, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> and therefore I was kind of like frenetic instead of incredibly poised. It's okay, it makes for a good story now. It's a great story. I couldn't wait to hear the end of the brick story, but as you got there, I'm like, oh, that's really good. So he's, he's also quite creative. And I think you gave some, some um, interesting and good advice there. Um, when you talk about that piece about self-doubt, I think that's a place I'd like to just pause for a minute and ask if any of the other panelists want to give a perspective on how to uh, overcome that self-doubt or moments in time where, um, and I love your balance of you're going to have self-doubt, but you also have to forgive yourself and have a sense of humor. Um, so I don't know if any, anybody wants to add anything or thoughts on how that might have impacted you or not. You're all jumping at the... <laughs> I'll take yeah, it. I'll, uh, I'll, oh. yeah, I'll weigh in. I mean, to me, okay. that self-doubt is exactly the voice in your head that I talked about earlier and you really do need to and the mechanisms for all of us participating in today's um, meeting I think are going to be different but you have to find some mechanisms where you can kind of silence the voice and for me that has been a little bit of okay but what do I know what can I offer and what I didn't say when I came into the CIO role we were heavily outsourced I came into the role with four people in an internal IT organization. So um, my light bulb went off when I thought, okay, I need to rebuild this organization. I under, I, I just, two, two positions ago, I was in HR. So you can kind of see how I, you know, I started thinking about, well, what can I do? And then once I started hiring these really smart people, like I didn't even know what an art, what architecture was, but when I heard about it, I remember thinking, I want one of those, you know, and I, I knew enough to be dangerous. <laughs> Jamila is laughing, but what, what I found was, you know, I use my HR and, and ability to assess talent and people to, to bring up the organization. Then when I got these new leaders around me, we figured out a way to communicate and around trade-offs. 
I was teaching them the business and they were teaching me enough of, of, around technology. And so we had value, you know, we added value to each other. And the other thing I would say is I've always been a why kind of person. My, my mother to this day, she's like, why, 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 why? She goes, you grew up that way. You're still that way as an adult. And in business, that's translated into uh, a little bit of what Amanda said. You need to commit to being a lifelong learner and really find that child in all of us of just sheer curiosity of like, wow, how did that happen? Or how does that work? Or what's the problem I'm trying to solve? And who and how do I need to get together? You know, I often find myself in this role of convener, right? Um, to bring together and to solve for business, customer, employee, you know, type solutions. So um, just think about, again, the strengths and how they apply to even the most challenging of your situations and just some natural curiosity and, and just an ability to, to, you know, ask questions along the way. Thank you. So we did get an audience question and then another question. So I'm, and I'm, asked, I'm going to ask this to each anyone who wants to respond, but how did you think about your development goals early in your career to guide you longer term in your career? So goals, developmental goals, and how did you think about them earlier in your career? I regularly ask candidates, you know, what's your five-year plan? What's the job after this job? And I, like hypocritically, that's never how I've thought. I've never said, this is where I want to be. This is the next title I want. My, my choices have been driven by choosing people. Uh, and it came out of the gates at Leo Burnett by being around the most interesting people that made working on consumer packaged goods interesting. The right people can make anything interesting and important and the wrong people can take a dream job and make it a living hell. So I choose being around the smartest people I can doing whatever, whether it's a board I'm on or extracurricular activities, like I try to be around the smartest people I can. And that, and that has served me very well. So I've never said in five years, I want to be a different person in this way. I choose people and I have total ownership. No matter what I'm doing, I think it matters. <laughs> it's like a, a, a survival and coping mechanism. I think whatever I'm working on is important. Uh, and, and it's been that kind of serendipitous journey. And I'm sure people can be more successful uh, if you're incredibly intentional about the ladder and the steps and stuff, but I don't know if you'll be happier. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my mode is like the happy mode. Like you can have a contented life if you choose the right people and then get obsessed, I, to use Jamil's word, obsessed about what you're working on, like really think it matters. Uh, you will learn, you will grow and probably everyone you're working around will, will, will value you as well. Well, and you talked about that too. And um, when you don't know something, you gather your people to help figure it out. So you choose the people. I always used to say early on, I, everybody needs a friend in finance. Nowadays, everybody needs a friend in finance. And a friend with some technical aptitude, um, but I, it, you you talked about it in, in other other intersections too. Anybody else that have? We do have quite a number of questions that come in, came in. We won't be able to get to all of them. Any other advice on development and how you treat your personal development early in your career? Alita, I was just going to add. For me, I've always thought of development not. I actually don't believe in career paths, um, so I've never thought about it as from a job or position standpoint, but I've always thought about it in what capability, what competency. As a marketing major, I should have paid more attention to finance, you know, your world. And so, you know, the ability to say, I need to really up my skill set in financial. Uh, I need to get better at operational. That doesn't mean I, I become a, a, a you know, financial analyst or an engineer, but I think of development from um, a skill, a learning and experiential. So I just group all that in capability building. And those are the things that are typically very transferable as you do uh, have opportunities along the way. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question because I do wanna do a round for everybody to be able to answer. Um, we talked about this ahead of time. Advice, your gamut of advice. It doesn't have to be specific to this panel, but good advice for people in their career or people in life, something you wish somebody had told you, the stuff we wanna write down. And Amanda, I'm gonna start with you and then I'm just gonna go around my Brady Bunch screen. So I'll do Jamila, Delna and Violet. So Amanda, go ahead. 
I was once in a panel where I got asked, I knew this question was coming. And so I turned to our chief creative officer, a guy named Tom Haley. And I said, Tom, what's the best advice I ever got? And he said, uh, find someone who loves you, but will tell you the truth, right? So it's like a mentor who cares about you, not the business, that kind of stuff. And I said that for about eight years, that was my, my go-to line, but I've recently changed it because I've been able to spend time with incredibly impressive people uh, where they kind of are telling me the truth. And my, if I could go give any advice to little Mandy, if I could go back 20 years and say anything, I would say, hey, little Mandy, have more audacious dreams. I already talked about this, but here's why it's important. The people who are most impressive to me never think about the next promotion. They think about the impact and change they're gonna create in the world. And just by saying you're gonna change the world doesn't mean you will, but literally everyone to a T started with a really big vision for impact. And so I just encourage women, especially young women, go bigger in your head, you will be more likely to get there and in shorter order. And then the second thing is because I don't know the, the audience, I don't know the stage of a career of the audience, I'll just say that I have reached in my 40s the age where who I know is more valuable than what I know. It's just, it's simple, it's whatever. If somebody's like, what about this? And I'll be like, oh, go talk to this person or oh, go to this resource or this vendor. It's like connecting now instead of being responsible for independent autonomous thought is more how I spend my time. And I would just wish I had known how valuable the network is earlier in my career, because in your 20s, former colleagues, you should be calling them and saying, hey, I'm struggling with this at work. How did you do it? Like peer networking should start on day one, not as CEOs, you know, in their 40s. So I would just say, like, start going to lunch and talk about your job. Talk about what you want to get better at. Talk about what's hard. Your peers will continue to be an exponentially and increasing uh, import, uh, important part of how you get stuff done. Uh, so that would be my my three pronged advice. Sorry for hogging the mic. Great, great. So, Jamila. Yeah, I want to touch on what Delna said um, earlier. Um, going back to pursuing, there's like this laundry list of technical skills and things like that. Um, it shows that when women see a list uh, for opportunity. And if we feel we're missing two of 10, we just write that, out. you know, some women may feel like they want to, you know, hey, I don't have everything on this list. I'm not going to pursue this opportunity, but it shows men can have three of the 10 and they're going for it, you know. So I think just don't let everything be a mountain, you know, don't let the pivot be a mountain, break it up into little, um, you know, achievable steps that are going to get you there. You know, don't overwhelm yourself, really enjoy the journey along the way. Um, and one of my mentors told me is that, you know, hey, you always have to have skin in the game. That's the start. And when people see you working really hard, even if you're struggling, um, I've had instances where so many people just flock to help you. Like we see you doing great stuff. This is a great program. We really want to help you. And that's a way to really, you know, go ahead and build your network. So, you know, your track record of success, you know, more than anything, like, <laughs> you know, yourself the best. So be confident in what you're trying to achieve and trying to pursue. Um, and another piece Amanda mentioned was every technology, every company is a technology company. So when you're transferring from business to technology, think about businesses need technology to run. And if you reverse that technology, businesses need business to run for internal finance and operations. So again, all those skills are transferable. So, you know, don't psych yourself. Thank, thank you, Delna and Go then. For it. Uh, sorry, it just broke up for me for a second there. Um, I think if you can hear me, just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I think that there's something that I wish I had known a while back is that um, sometimes, I mean, it was beneficial, but it also could have helped to build a strategy. I was kind of oblivious to no. You know, when people said no, I would say, well, to Isla's point, why? Like, what? What is that? What come? But I think the what the coping strategy I should have learned is okay. What can I do now to change it so that I'm providing value to the other person? So now the no is more like, oh, okay, this is what you could do, and this is how you can share. Um, I I was I'm from a family of entrepreneurs. You know, we've uh, when you have that immigrant mentality, you kind of say I I can pursue and do anything I want because that's I need that because that's my crutch to move forward over and over again but it's also kind of a, a hard journey you know you're not exactly enjoying yourself at that point you're just moving forward for the for the heck of it in a way um, but once I started to change it to like okay it's no but what else could I help you with you know what is the value that I can provide here even if I'm 
an intern and an associate or whatever the role is, uh, it started to become better and better. And I honestly didn't learn it early enough. I wish I had because I feel like the opportunities would have opened up to me. I would have seen that from a conference perspective, I had more skills to provide as well. Um, rather than like, oh, you said, no, I'm just going to go build my own, you know, <laughs> which I think eventually came, became my career path. And I'm happy to be uh, where I'm at. And then the second thing I would say is it's okay to be true to yourself. Like I am uh, in, I like the way Amanda put it. I am the suit in my company, you know, which is uh, a hard position to have because I'm the one people come to and I'm like, you know, I'm that person, but I'm also the person who sometimes has to have the uh, important point to say, no, that would go against privacy or that would be an ethical issue. Uh, I don't appreciate that. I think that this is the way, and I like that. I like that role because I know that it's an important one to have at a, a biometric company or a tech company because we don't see that role really carved out. Um, and I hope that when I leave the company or you know whatever happens with Keo, that that becomes part of the job description is yeah. that you do need to have a strong compass. Yeah, I love it. Violet, um, you are our wrap up, and then I think we're turning it over to who's doing closing remarks. Mark, I think Mark Lafferty. All right. Well, two quick things. One, you know, I, I would say network is not a dirty word, and sometimes there's a gender bias, you know, for women. I would say build your network, utilize your network, share your network with men and women um, that you come across, you know, both personally as well as professionally. Second thing, um, my mother's best advice to me was, and always wear good shoes. So just, just soak that in a bit. And that was her way of saying, you got this, you've studied, you, you know, you've practiced that clarinet. I was a horrible clarinet player. You've practiced, you've practiced the speech for debate club wear good shoes. That was her way of saying, be confident and just get yourself out there. Love it. My definition of good shoes may have changed in the last time. For left, sure. I <laughs> I'm barefoot and I'm struggling with this right now <laughs> that I'm wearing sweatpants and I'm barefoot, but you know, COVID. Thank you so much for our panelists. Let me turn it over to Mark Lafferty, the, the co-chair of the Women in Tech Forum or the Tech Forum and we're the women. Okay, go ahead, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Alita. Good afternoon, everyone. What a wonderful discussion we just heard. I'm Mark Lafferty, Director of Federal Sales at CDW and co-chair for the Executives Club Business Technology Forum. Please, please help me thank all our fantastic speakers by dropping a line in the chat with your best takeaway from today. I know I have a many that I could type in there. As a technology leader in Chicago and a leader of this forum, we enjoy putting together this Women in Technology program every year and finding new themes that resonate with our audience and the Chicago community at large. As you notice, these events are not only about championing gender diversity in tech, but also highlighting the incredible leadership and expertise of these women. We hope you found this panel helpful to you and your organization. Keep an eye on the Executives Club website for our upcoming virtual programs. In particular, we hope you can join us next week on June 24th for our final forum event of the 2021 season. The Manufacturing and International Business Forums are hosting a joint panel on supply chain risk management and crisis response. You can sign up online at executiveclub.org. With that, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and thanks again for joining us and see you soon. Thanks everybody. <laughs>